Hello, and today we are going to look into the 1550s to 1600 in Western European fashion. Last time we looked into 1500 to 1550s, where our beloved uh, Henry's wives were featured in the video and the clothes were absolutely amazing but things are only going to get better from then on now let's look at the fashion and the period in the Western European clothing was characterized by an increase of opulence contrasting fabrics and slashes and embroidery applied trims and um, other, other, other form of surface ornaments remained uh, a very prominent. The main silhouette, conical woman with breadth at the hip and broadly square uh, for men with the width at the shoulder had reached its peak in the nine, uh, <laughs> 1530s, of course. Uh, and by the mid-century, a tall and narrow line with V-shaped waist was back in fashion, and sleeves of the woman began to, uh, of the with sleeves and skirts of the woman began to widen again, and with emphasis at the shoulders that would continue into the next century. And the characteristic garment of the period was rough. <laughs> Uh, which began as a modest ruffle uh, attached to the neckband of a skirt or smock and grew into a, a separate garment of a fine linen trimmed with lace, cutwork or embroidery and shaped into a crisp, precise folds with starch and heated irons and our, our famous Elizabethan era painting portrait of Queen Elizabeth the First with all the ruffles all around her neck. Very fabulous. General trends. Now let's look at Spanish style. Charles V, King of Spain, Naples, and Sicily, um, Holy Roman Emperor, handed over the Kingdom of Spain to his son. Philip the Second and the King and the Empire to his brother Ferdinand the First in fifteen fifty eight, ending the domination of Western Europe by a single court. But the Spanish taste for somber richness of dress would dominate fashion for the remainder of the century. A new alliance and trading pattern arose as divide between Catholic and Protestant countries became more and more pronounced. The severe rigid fashions of Spanish court were dominant everywhere except France and Italy. Black garments were worn for the most formal occasions. Black was difficult and expensive dye and seen as luxurious if in an austere way, as as well as Spanish courtiers, uh, it uh, it ap appealed to the wealthy middle class Protestants. So, um, and regional styles were still distinct. The clothing was very intricate and elaborate, and made with heavy fabrics such as velvet and raised silk. Um, topped off with brightly colored jewels such as rubies and diamonds and pearls to contrast the bla black backdrop of the clothing. Um, uh, now, linen ruffs grew from a narrow frill at the neck and the wrist to a broad cartwheel style that uh, required a wire support by 1580s. Mm. <laughs> Ruffles were worn throughout Europe by men and women of all classes and they were made of rectangular lengths of linen as long as 19 yards. Later ruffs were made of delicate uh, a 
delicate fabric and a cutwork lace that evolved into needle laces in the 17th century. Let's look at Elizabethan era, Elizabethan style. Since uh, Elizabeth I, Queen of England, was the ruler, uh, women's fashion became one of the most important aspects of this period. As the queen was always required to have pure image, and although women's fashion became increasingly seductive, the idea of perfect Elizabethan woman was never forgotten. Elizabethan era had its own customs and social rules that were reflected in their fashion. Uh, style would depend usually on the social status. Elizabethans were bound to obey Eliz the Elizabethan sumptuary law, which oversaw the style and materials worn. Elizabethan sumptuary laws were used to control the behaviors and ensure that the specific um, structures was maintained. This set of rules were well known by all the English people and meant penalties for violating these sumptuary laws were harsh fines and most of the time ended in loss of property and titles and even life sometimes. <laughs> So regarding the fabrics, uh, regarding to fabrics and materials of the clothes of construction, uh, only royalty were permitted to wear ermine. Other nobles, lesser ones, were allowed to only wear fox and otters. Clothes were worn during um, clothes worn during this era were usually mostly inspired by geometric shapes. Uh, probably derived from high interest in science and mathematics in that era. So padding and quilting with the use of the whalebone and buckram uh, for stiffening purposes were very used to gain geometric effects with emphasis on giving the illusion of the small waist just like uh, uh, 50 years before them. <clears throat> in the upper crust of society, restrictions were also applicable. A certain material, such as cloth of gold, could only be worn by the queen and her mother, her children, her aunts, or sisters, along with the duchesses, marquises, and the countesses, people holding their other nobility titles, such as viscountesses, baronesses, were also not allowed to use these materials. Not only fabrics were restricted in the Elizabethan era, but also colors depending on social status. Purple was only allowed to be worn by the queen and her direct family members, depending on the social status. The color could be used in any clothing or uh, would be limited to mantles, doublets, jerkins, and other specific items. Uh, lower classes were only allowed to use brown, beige, or uh, yellow, orange, green, gray, or blue in wool, linen, and sheepskin. Uh, while usual fabrics for upper crusts were silk and velvet. Fabrics and trends. No. The general trend towards the abundant surface ornamentation of Elizabethan era expressed in clothing, especially amongst the aristocracy in England. Uh, shirts and chemises were embroidered with black work and edged with lace. Heavy cut velvets and brocades were further ornaments with uh, um, applied bobbin lace, gold, silver, embroidery, and jewels. Toward the end of the period, polychrome or multicolored silk embroidery became highly desirable and fashionable for the public representation of aristocratic wealth. The origins of the trend for somber colors are elusive, but are generally attributed to the growing influence of Spain and possibly the importation of Spanish merino wools. The Low Countries, uh, such as uh, German states, Scandinavia and England and France and Italy, all observed the sombering uh, 
<laughs> I would say sobering and formal influence of Spanish dress after the mid uh, 1520s um, the fine textiles could be dyed in the grain with expensive combs uh, uh, alone or as an over dye with wood to produce a wide range of color from blacks to grays through browns and murrays um, purples and sanguines inexpensive reds and oranges and pinks were dyed with madder and blue uh, blues with wood uh, and one with variety of common plants such as yellow dyes although uh, although most were prone to fading by the end of the period, there was a sharp distinction between the sober fashions favored by Protestants in England and Netherlands, which still showed heavy Spanish influence in the light um, that revealed the fashions of French and uh, Italian courts. The distinction could, would carry over to the, well into the 17th century. And then let's look into women's fashion. Uh, women's outer clothing generally consists of loose uh, uh, or fitted gowns worn over a kirtle or petticoat or both. An alternative to women's uh, gown was a short jacket or doubled um, cut with a high neck line. The narrow shouldered wide cuffed trumpet sleeve characteristic of the 19th uh, I keep saying 19, 1540s and 1550s in uh, France and England it disappeared in 1560s. In uh, in favor of French and the Spanish style with with narrow sleeves. So overall, silhouettes was uh, narrow throughout the 19, uh, 1560s, obviously. Uh, and gradually widened and emphasized as the shoulder and hip. The slashing technique seen in Italian dresses in 1560s evolved into a single or double rows of loops at the shoulder with contrasting linings. By the uh, 1580s, these had been adopted in England as padded or and jeweled shoulder rolls. Uh, gowns and kirtles and petticoats. Now, the upper, uh, the common upper garment was a a gown uh, uh, called in Spanish uh, ropa, in French robe, and in English either gown or frock. Uh, gowns were made in variety of styles, loose or fitted, called in English, uh, called in England a, a French gown, with a short half sleeves or long sleeves, and uh, floor length or a round gown with a trailing train cloth clothing. Um, now, a uh, gown was worn over a kirtle or a petticoat or both for warmth. Prior to 1545, the kirtle consisted of a fitted one-piece garment. After that date, either kirtles or petticoats might might have attached bodices or bodies that fastened with lacing or hooks and eye, and most had sleeves that were pinned and laced in place. The Part of the kirtle or petticoat that showed beneath the gown were usually made of richer fabrics, especially the front panel or forepart of the skirt. Bodices of the French and Spanish and English styles were stiffened into a cone or a flattened triangular shape ending with a V at the front of the woman's waist. Um, Italian fashion uniquely featured a broad U-shaped uh, rather than a V shape. Spanish women were also uh, wore uh, boned and heavy corsets such as Spanish bodies that compressed with uh, the torso into a smaller but equally geometric cones. The um, bodices could uh, bodices could be high necked or have a broad, low 
square neckline with a slight arch at the front early in the period. Uh, the, they fastened with hooks in the front or were laced at the back seam. Um, high-necked bodices styled like men's doublet might fasten with hooks or buttons. Italian and German fashion retained a front-laced bodice of the previous period with the ties laced in parallel. Those, oh. Okay, now let's look at the, the ultimate, most important, excuse my neighbor child, <laughs> and now, uh, well, let's look into the underwears. During this period, women's underwears consisted of washable linen chemise or smock. This was the only article of clothing that was worn by every woman, regardless of class. Have uh, well, so wealthy women, a smock were embroidered or <laughs> trimmed with narrow lace. Smocks were made of rectangular length of linen. In the north, uh, northern England, Europe, northern Europe, <laughs> the smock skimmed the body and was widened with triangular gores, while in Mediterranean countries smocks were cut fuller in the body and sleeves, high-necked smocks were worn under high-necked fashions um, to protect the expensive outer garment from oily bodily oil or dirt, and um, there there is pictorial evidence that the Venetian courtesans were uh, wore linen or silk drawers, but no evidence uh, that <laughs> drawers were worn in England. Stockings or hose were generally made of woven wool sewn into shape and held into place by ribbon garters. And true corset called Vesquin in Spanish arose in the first half of 16th century in Spain. The fashion spread from there in Italy and then to France and eventually England, where it was called a pair of bodies, uh, being in two parts with laced back and front. Um, corsets was restricted. Um, mm -hmm. Corset was restricted to aristocratic fashion and was fitted bodices uh, uh, stiffened with reed called bands, woods, or whalebones. It's very interesting to look into the bodices of this era and this, uh, especially the 17th century, later on the 18th century. Uh, the bodices, um, the uh, I would say corsets have become evolutionary in the 18th century, where the Victorian era, where it was adopted into shape of distinctive S shape, but that was not very healthy for the ladies. It wasn't at all healthy. Um, it was dangerous, but it was just socially desired, those shapes. But in this era, however, in the 15th century, it was not to get the desired S shape, although it is desired for um, all of us to have some uh, good shape <laughs> with some corsets. In this era, however, it was more of a geometric shape rather than S shape. So that's the difference. Now let's look into skirts. Skirts were held in the proper shapes by a fardingale or a hoop skirt. Remember the fardingale? <laughs> it's the a fardingale <laughs> um, from the 15th century. Well, um, in Spain, the cone-shaped Spanish farthingale um, remained in fashion in the early 17th century, and it was only briefly fashionable in France. 
um, where padded rolls or French fartingales called uh, English, uh, 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 sorry, uh, called in England a uh, bum roll, right? Um, held the skirt up, uh, skirts out in the rounded shape at the waist, um, falling the soft flods to the floor in England. The Spanish fighting girls were worn throughout the 19... 19 again? No, 1570s, and was gradually replaced by the French fighting girl. Ah, uh, skirt hoops, skirt hoops. <laughs> by the 1590s, skirts were pinned to a wide wheel of skirt hoops to uh, achieves, um, achieve a drum shape, those huge shapes. Um, well, uh, it's very interesting to look into that era where it was desired to have such shape. Um, well, it's something that is very foreign to us. However, I would love to see I would love to travel back in time to look at all of those people look at a court the courtesans <laughs> look at how they really used to dress mm. would be something now let's look at partlet a low neckline might be filled with infills um, partlets worn over the smock, but under the kirtle and gown were typically uh, made of lawn or fine linen, and uh, partlets were also worn over a kirtle and gown. A color of over partlets varied, and white and black were most common. The partlets might be made of the same material as the kirtle or richly decorated with lace detailing to complement it. Uh, embroidered partlets, partlets <laughs> and sleeve sets were frequently given to Elizabeth as New Year's gift. How, uh, how great is that? Now, um, out of wear, women wore sturdy overskirts called safeguards over their dresses for riding or travel on dirty roads. Hooded cloaks were worn in the bad weather. You know this, um, little, <coughs> little red riding hood hoods. <laughs> I love this type of things. It's, um, it's absolutely amazing. Now, one, one description mentions strings being attached to the stirrups or a foot to hold the skirt in the place when riding. Mantles are also uh, popular and described as modern day bench warmers, a square blanket of rug that is attached to the shoulders worn around the body or on the knees for extra warmth. Beside keeping warm, Elizabethan's cloaks were useful for many type of weather. The uh, gasok, uh, commonly known as the Dutch cloak, uh, but so, so another kind of cloak. Its name implies some mili military ideals that has been used since the beginning of the 16th century and therefore many forms. Though the cloak is identified by its flaring out at the shoulders and intricately decoration, uh, intricacy of dec decoration, and the cloak was worn uh, to the ankle or waist for a fork. Um, it also had a specific measurement of a three-fourth cut. The longer length were more popular for travel and more came with many varieties. These included taller color th than normal, upturned color or no color at all at the sleeves, um, and the sleeves. <laughs> so, um, French cloak was quite the opposite of the Dutch and was worn anywhere uh, from the knees to ankle and mm, it was typically worn over the left shoulder and included a cape that came below the elbow. 
uh, it was highly decorated uh, cloak. Uh, the Spanish cloak or a cape was well known to be stiff and have a very decorated hood and was worn to the hip or waist. Uh, the overgown for women was very plain and worn loosely to the floor ankle length. And the jupe had a relation to the safeguard and they would usually be worn together. The jupe replaced the Dutch cloak and was uh, mostly most likely to lose a uh, form of the doublet. Now let's look at accessories. The fashion of wearing or carrying pelts of sable or ma marten spread from a continental Europe into England in this period. Costume historians call these accessories zibellini or flea furs. The most expensive zibellini had uh, faces and paws or goldsmith's work with jeweled eyes. Elizabeth, uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, received one as a New Year's gift in 1584 gloves of perfumed leather featured embroidered cuffs uh, folding fans appeared in the le late in the period replacing flat fans of or mm, ostrich feathers <laughs> now um jewelry was also popular among these uh, those who could afford it so Necklaces were beaded gold, silver chains, and worn in uh, concentric circles, reaching as far down as the waist. Uh, ruffs also had a jewelry attachment, um, such as glass beads, embroidery gems, brooches, and flowers, and belts were also surprisingly necess necessity used either for fashion or uh, more practical purposes. Lower classes worn them, wore them uh, almost as two belts, with upper classes using them as another uh, place to add jewelry and gems. Like uh, so, the scarves, although not often mentioned, had a significant impact on the Elizabethan style by being a multi-purpose <laughs> piece of clothing. So. Uh, they could be worn on the head to protect the desirable pale skin from the sun, uh, warm the neck or a colder day, and accentuate color scheme of the gown to whole outfit. <laughs> the upper class had silken scarves and every color and brightened up the outfit, with the gold thread or tassels hanging off of it. While traveling, noble women could wear oval masks of black velvet called vizards to protect their face from the sun. And now, hairstyles and headgear. A married or a grown woman covered their hair as they had in previous periods. Early in the period, hair was parted in the center and ruffed, uh, fluffed over the temples. Later, uh, front hair was curled and puffed over the foreheads. Wigs and false hairline hair pieces were used to extend the hair. A close-fitting uh, linen cap called coif or biggins was worn, uh, alone with um, or under the hat or hood, especially in the Netherlands and England. Many embroidered or bobbin laced trimmed uh, English coifs survived during this. Period. The French hood was also worn throughout the period in both France and England. Another fashionable headdress um, was a col or a cap, a network of linen in silk attached to a band which covered the pinned up hair. Um, this style of headdress had also been seen in Germany in the first half of the century, a widow's mourning. Uh, wore black hoods with sheer black veils. Let's look at uh, the makeup in this period. The ideal standard of beauty for women in Elizabethan era was to have a light and naturally red hair. 
a pale complexion, red cheeks and lips, pale white skin was desired because Queen Elizabeth was uh, in reign and she had naturally red hair and pale complexion and red cheeks and lips. Also it was uh, to look very English uh, since the main enemy of England was Spain. The Spain um, darker hair was uh, dominant. To uh, further enhance the desired pale complexion, women wore a layered uh, white makeup on their faces. This makeup, uh, called kerusi, was made up of a white lead and vinegar, which is so hard, uh, so bad, dangerous. Um, so women wearing kerusi achieved the white face, however, the white lead that was used to make it is it is very poisonous. Um, women in this time often contracted lead poisoning which resulted in deaths before the age of 50. And other ingredients used in the makeup were unfortunately sul sulfur, alum and tin ash. In addition to using makeup to achieve the pale complexion, women in this era were uh, bled to take a uh, the color out of their faces. Mm. For the uh, red cheeks or red lips, dyes were used sometimes. Uh, cochineal or madder or vermilion were used as dyes to achieve the bright red effect on the face. And uh, not only the cheeks and lips emphasized, a coal was used to darken the eyelashes and emphasize the size and appearance of the eyes. I hope that you enjoyed this uh, woman's uh, uh, 1550s to 1560s, the Elizabethan Eastern European fashion. Um, and I very much enjoyed making this. It's very interesting to look into what the fashion was back then what the people wore, what was the perception, what type of things you were using, they were using to poison themselves in fashion's name. Now, uh, let me know if you have enjoyed this, uh, today's fashion lesson. I hope to see you very soon. See you next time.